evening, Johnny. Are you there on the phone? I am here on the Good phone. Good man yourself, Johnny. Okay, Johnny, the album is now finished. I presume all ready to go. Are you a happy man? Yeah, it's all done. It's on a shiny CD. We can't change it anymore. Okay, well, what's all this sort of experimental, sprawling, like, Pink Floyd-y bits that I've been hearing about? <laughs> Pink Floyd? That's what I've been, I've, been, I've been hearing that you were listening to your Walkman, and you've got metal by Pink Floyd on it, which is which was at least the same year you were born or something. That's true. It's all true. So what do you like about metal? Is it echoes, is it? It is echoes, I'm afraid. And, and the first track as well. One of these days I'm going to cut you into little pieces. Which you can only hear when he goes, one of these days I'm going to cut you into little pieces. Then you hear all this sort of sprawling stuff. Did you know that was used in a movie, a very famous movie? Which movie? Uh, it was called uh, uh, The Brisky Point by oh, right. Michelangelo and Tony no. I thought I'd throw that in and try and impress him. I, I'm duly impressed. Good, I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> okay, well now listen, tell us. Um, the first album, I mean, Pablo Honey did whatever it did. And in terms of sort of looking back on history now, people will say that a bit like one or two other bands, let's mention Bush most recently in terms of just what happened, it seemed to become huge in America and not so big at home, and then only home sort of caught on a bit later. But it's not strictly true that Pablo Honey did do hugely well in America, is it? Exactly, yeah. I'm, I'm glad the message is getting through. We kind of, the Tony interview that people just said, you know, you're huge in America, but it was just a case of creep being huge in America, and we were sort of going traveling around playing it. But when, one of the times the creep was huge in America, about the time that it did become big, it was about the time that everything else was happening over here in terms of the media, in terms of, say, Pulp and Blur and Oasis. Do you think in some ways that you were quite glad, or in hindsight, to be well out of the way of all of that and not be caught in the Britpop net? Yeah, I think so. Well, now we're getting caught in this, in this new grave net. There's this new, new, new uh, scene in England, supposedly. It's been called the new, gr new wave of new grave. And all these supposedly serious bands like Manson and, and are, being, are being linked with us. So it's funny, isn't it? There's always, there's always something new. Well, do you think that maybe it's because of Tom? I mean, like, there's definitely a few people that probably thought they'd lived their lives as the soundtracks of the last two Radiohead albums in the background. And that maybe they take Radiohead a bit too seriously and Tom's lyrics a bit too seriously. I don't know. I, I know Tom finds some of his lyrics um, very amusing and entertaining. So. Uh, but that's just his sense of humour, so I don't know, you'd have to ask him. Okay, well look, you have the album The Bend there, which is the second one, which has got through to everybody. And, right. And, and has got across, like, sold millions of albums right across the world. So, what about this new one now, about the actual getting down to record it? When you decided to do that, why did you s decide to go away to a, to a house to do it and not do it in the studio? Did you have as much time as you wanted? Were you allowed self-produce, etc.? What was the mood after, after The Bend? Well, Let's think. I don't know. The success of the band didn't really kick in until we were, you know, halfway through recording this one. So, so it, it was good. It just felt like we were kind of carrying on from the band. Really, there was no big change of change of emotion or change of plan. Really, um, and we just decided to go to a country house because they're they're just a bit more um, um what's the word anonymous, a bit less. You know, they're they're not steeped in rock history. There isn't. You know, chewing gum on the, on, in the carpets and gold discs from 1974 on the wall, and you know, yeah, yeah. Just we, I mean, we've gone into studios and there's kind of piles of girly mags from the band who were in there the day before, and it's like, oh, you know, what are we doing here? So we just decided to turn turn a big empty house into a studio. And did it work? I mean, in terms of the atmosphere, in terms of sort of like letting your head get involved in this recording of a third album, did it work? Yeah, it really worked. It just um. I mean, we had some, some really intense and, and depressing times and some exciting and kind of, you know, happy and confident times. So it's kind of, we've, we've been through it all. And how much of this new album was done beforehand, before you went to that house? Or did you sort of just let it all evolve as you were there? We, we kind of, we're a band that loves arranging. So we, we spent a fair long while arranging all, all the new songs into, into recordable shape. You know, we kind of, we like things to be finished before we start recording, really. And how sprawling or how epic is this album? I mean, could I just say it's the third, it's the third album from the band, that's it? Or could I say, no, this is a real departure? I mean, is there room to move? I mean, is there room to sort of go into a different direction? And is this album a different direction? I don't know. I mean, the common conception at the moment is that, I think in the industry anyway, was that we were all set up to the big third album crossover, sort of. But in a way, I think this album's going to make most sense to people who know the band. I mean, it feels like half of the songs could have been on the band. And maybe the other half of the songs could have been, you know, on our next album if we do one. So it's just, it's like, it's, it's, it's the people who know and understand the bands, I think, more than the, you know, 
kids in America to, to listen to on the radio and get into or whatever, whatever the, the industry we're hoping for. Do you feel in any way at all that this, I mean, that, that the band's album, I mean, like the Radiohead would be seen, like let's just take 70s terms for a second, would, 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 would be seen as an album with band. And yet, by the same token, it's the five or six singles as they got sort of constantly played on radio, as each one dropped down the chart, another one came back in. So people realized, my God, this is like a greatest hits album. I mean, this is like something really special. Like if it's got that, 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 and that, I'll definitely buy it now. Yeah. Do you, do you sort of see it that way, that maybe the singles were actually a very good idea to just keep releasing them? Well, I think it's a bit of a sort of um, throwback to the 80s when, when so many albums were sold on the strength of one single, and it's still happening now, you know. I, I, it's happened to me, you go and buy a record because you like one song and the rest of the album is awful. And uh, I just, that's, that's what we're fighting against. Okay, well before I play the single, can I just go back to what I was talking about at the very beginning? What seriously music were you listening to, and if if you are listening to a certain kind of music before you go into record, does that influence the eventual recording? Because you're talking there about arrangements as well and everything. I mean, if you're listening to something like Metal by Pink Floyd, and with a track like Echoes, which is like 22 minutes long or whatever, or one of these days, and I'll cut you up into little pieces, which is a good long sort of meandering piece of sort of noise, or white noise, whatever, is there anything from those that you would take and then sort of inform the new album with it, if you know what I mean? I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, we're quite sort of... We're, we're quite snobby in a way. It's like we we have music that we like, but we we I think as individuals we we hear more things wrong with it than right with it. So like that that's a great Floyd album, but you know two of the songs are just, they're awful, and and you know this doesn't work and that doesn't work. But but having said that, some of the the ideas and the emotions behind the songs are really exciting. So yeah, we are kind of scavengers in that in that respect. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of scavengers. No harm in that. Okay, I think what I'm going to do. I'm going to play the single from the album now. This is Radiohead. And this is the brand new single, it's called Paranoid Android. Paranoid Android is the title of the song, Radiohead is of course the band, I'm talking to Johnny. So Johnny, you are playing here, this big gig that's coming up on the 21st of June. Yeah, the RDS. That's right. Do you remember well the one in Galway on the end of July last year? Oh, of course I do, yeah, classic. And the Olympian in... in, uh, in Two days before that. Oh, again. Yeah, and both those gigs. I mean, they were like the big buzz gigs of the year in this part of the world, I can tell you. Yeah, they, they just blew our heads apart. We just, you know... The last time we've been in, been in Ireland, it had just been to, you know, a handful of people in the rock garden. And then yeah, we come back right. to that, we just, we, just, we just completely overawed by it. It was like being on a cloud for a week. Well, that one in Galway, like, was that one of the biggest headliners that you as Radiohead had played to date? Yeah, definitely. And certainly one of the most, one with the most emotion flying around. So it's just, I'm still, I'm smiling as I'm talking about it. Right, so you're going to be playing this time around now on the 21st of June outdoors at the RDS. That's right. So, how much of the set, or do you know anything yet about a live set? What's the, what's the division? Like, is it going to be sort of first half new album, second half Pablo Honey and the Benz? <laughs> we've never had that much preparation for anything we've done in our lives ever. So, I, I, we'll probably know half an hour before we play. And not before then. I don't know, we kind of, you know, we like asking people what they want to hear. And yeah, that's true. You, you, you certainly did that one in Galway, all right, yeah. What about the, the, the reproduction of this album on stage? That's going to be sort of no problem. There's nothing sort of like, I mean, I'm thinking here constantly in terms of Echoes by Pink Floyd, which they right. did try at Pompeii and sort of half and half, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you, like, you're, you'll be okay with the new album, yeah? I think so, yeah. Well, like I say, you know, we, we, we spend a while arranging and making sure we can all play, even if it means that one of us has to, you know, play the keyboard with the end of the guitar or, or whatever, as long as we can play it as a five piece and then, yeah. then we'll record it. Yeah. Do you think, looking back in any way, that when, when Creep was as successful as it was in the States, and then it became a hit over in this part of the world, but it was a success in the States, so it looks as though, you know, Radiohead with the latest uh, export from Britain, they were on their way, they have a daily album out called Pablo Honey, and then you released really Stop Whispering and it didn't work. Do you think in some ways that that's actually maybe been a good thing, and it sort of lets you concentrate without any record company hassle on the second album, The Bands, which has now put you where you are? Um, yeah, I suppose so. I don't know. It's so long ago. Um, I don't know. Does it really feel that long ago, yeah? It does really, you know, it's sort of, we just, we're just struggling to start recording the bands and once that started, you know, everything else before that, we've just, we've forgotten really. And what about then the tour, the band's tour itself? I mean, that's the sort of thing that sorts out the men from the mice, basically. I mean, how did you all feel by the end of a tour like that? As in, never again, or, hey, great, I can't wait to get back on the road. Uh, I think we were nearer mice than men by the end of it, but, um... Touring is an amazing opportunity for, for travelling and, and playing music, and, and we're, we're into it. I'm, kind of, I'm getting less and less inarticulate as I realise that 
I'm speaking on the radio in Ireland and it's starting to melt my brain, so do forgive me. Start talking quick. Why is it starting to melt your brain? <laughs> I I don't know, I'm kind of I've I've been holed up in a in a in a country house recording for far too long. I haven't seen anybody, let, let alone or spoken to anyone. Let alone anybody as far away as you. Well, what about memories of, for instance, like that tour that I mentioned there? I mean, the band tours in color for a minute, which is like, for instance, like one time you were on stage at a gig in Cleveland, and you was it you that ended up in hospital? That's right. Yeah, I kind of my my ear decided to to generate noise and blood and all by itself. It wasn't nice of it. So I got to go and and, and faint in the casualty ward of Cleveland Hospital, and it was. Enormously grim, and nothing like ER either. It was just sort of, it, is. it was just depressing. It wasn't even exciting. And Ed fell off the stage once and had the camera back on, and and, and and Tom collapsed in Munich once as well, didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it does. Yeah, we kind of we don't look after ourselves that well. Well, did the band who did all the collapsing on their tour, the Monster Tour, REM, did they look after you in some ways? I mean, like you were, you did play quite a bit with them. I mean, how close did you get to them, or did you find them as friends, or did you get any good music from them, or did you just find that you got a dodgy sound check and then the major guys went down later? No, we got embarrassingly huge amounts of consideration, and um, uh, and they they sort of just stand in the wings watching us play every night, and it was just, you know, just wanted to ask them to stop being quite so considerate and uh, and encouraging, and it was lovely of them. And also, they were, they were still, you know, massively into rehearsing new stuff and, and, and mm. being in a band. We just we had this horrible feeling they might be um you know, might be sick of it all or might be, you know, tired and, and, and bored with, with music generally. But it was the opposite. We kind of you'd walk past the dressing room and they'd be in there recording or writing and it was just it was cool. It's it's an exciting time. And this is after you know, they'd done two years of touring nearly, so yeah, they're, they're still they were still mad for it, as our Manchester cousins would would say. Yeah, right, indeed. Okay, well then, finally, going, like, just with that REM thing then, did you think you learned anything on that level, that, like, whether they wanted to or not, or reluctantly or whatever, like, they released, say, a couple of albums in the early 90s, and they stay at home, and they sell 30 million between them. So when they eventually go on the road, you know there's going to be 50 to 60,000 at every single gig. Now, that's not an easy thing to handle. It looks as though REM handled it very well, indeed, by simply being interested in the music and maybe not much else, which is probably the way to do it. Do you think in any way at all that if it comes to 20 to 40,000, they're still going to have to play through every night, or whatever it happens to be, that you learned something from R.E.M. even on that level? Um, I don't know, they, they were kind of, what impressed me about R.E.M. is that they were still quite pragmatic about it all. So, that, you know, they weren't, there was no false modesty. They were sort of saying, well, they felt like they were doing one of the biggest tours in America that year, which was true. And they were saying, you know, we're, we're the main touring band and we've got to put on a good show. So, you know, I think it's, it's good to be that kind of, to have respect for the people you're playing to. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mean, the last tour we played in England was only to a couple of thousand people, which, you know, sounds like a lot of people in my head. Yeah. So we're still at that stage, really. Um, so I can't, I can't imagine more, than, more people than that coming to see us. Okay, well, then on the album, by the way, just on, on the credits that I have here, it says Ed is on polite guitar and that you're on abusive guitar. <laughs> it doesn't, does that sort of just sum up the sort of twin sort of guitar attack of Radiohead? I mean, it's just as simple as that, that Ed is a little bit more polite than, more, more polite than yours. I think so. I, mean, I don't have much respect for, for, for guitars or for people who um, are obsessed with guitars, so that's sort of how I try and play. Really? I mean, down through the years, have you not liked, like, could you not sort of point to a guitar, say, say from, I don't know, from Jimmy Page right now to John Squire or something like that and say, hey, that's pretty good, I really like that, there's no instrument in rock quite like the guitar, no? Not really, I just, I, um... I've, I've done interviews with guitar magazines, and, and they're always very depressing for both of us because I usually launch into some detailed question about what kind of pickup I've got. Ah, no, hold on, I didn't mean that. That kind of stuff for the pants off. Well, me. quite. No, I'm just talking, I'm, like, I'd sort of go, wow, listen to that, isn't that fantastic? I don't oh, really want to know what pickup or flange you use. Well, quite. Right. <laughs> no, kind of, but even that, it's like, I kind of, um, my favourite guitarist, I just sort of think of as being band members, so. I kind of I love the guitar playing in magazines, for example. Right. But it, took me, things, yeah. but it took me a while to to um to remember that it was John McGill. Yeah, John McGill. You know, McGill, so yeah. it's kind of I've never really thought of guitarists as being separate things from from songwriters or bands, really. Right. Yeah. It's the whole enchilada. All right, Johnny. Listen, thank you very much indeed for talking to us, and we all look forward to you very much coming here for the 21st of June to the gig. The album itself is going to be released a couple of weeks before that. 
and we'll have it on, on, on here on night time show if they have a good bit. So listen, take it easy, Johnny. I'm sure you're very pleased the album is now over. Yeah, massively pleased. Good, but by the same token, I'm sure after a tour you'll be well looking forward to going back in the studio again too. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of into recording now. Right, indeed. All right, Johnny, thanks a million. Good luck. Thanks for talking to us. Okay, see you soon. Uh, okay. Okay.